Hi and welcome back to Spoods and Stuff. Today's video is going to be about my geckos. Now I've featured them on this channel before. I've shown them off. Uh, I had them basically on, on a bit of branch and I showed them off and talked a little bit about them. But today I want to talk more about their environments and a little bit about their care. This isn't a full care video. It's not a definitive care video. It's just uh, basically it's observations that I've made throughout my time keeping them. I've been keeping geckos for about 18 months now, about six months longer than I have the spiders. And uh, I think they're brilliant pets. They're wonderful. They're beautiful. They're fascinating. And uh, I just wanted to give a little bit of a little bit of a talk about them, a little bit of information about them. And uh, like I say, just bits and pieces I've picked up and I've learned through keeping them myself. So uh, we'll get on with the video and I'll see you at the end. So these are the four setups that I currently have. Uh, we have in the tank, you can see in front of you, we have my crested gecko. Uh, he's about two years old now, I believe. He's, he's fully grown, he won't get any bigger. I'll try and show you him in a bit more detail in a bit. But um, this is one of the two bioactive setups I have. The other two, we have this set up here, which is for a gargoyle gecko. Uh, this one isn't bioactive. It will be eventually, but um, as you can see, there's still still a nice environment for the gecko. The other two tanks we have are down below on the rack. Uh, the one on the right is another bioactive setup, which I'll get into in more detail. And the one on the left, again, isn't. It's all plastic plants. But uh, all three of those tanks are for gargoyle geckos. I think there are so many more advantages to having bioactive setups. Excuse me, I keep kicking the foot of my tripod here. Um, I, I actually think that real plants are more of an advantage for the geckos. I mean, people don't need them. Some people choose to have just plastic plants and uh, decorations that way, and that's, that's absolutely fine. But personally, I like bioactive setups. Now, this one isn't... Uh, as good as it could be in my opinion there's a couple of plants that have uh, died off but um, they seem to be growing back a bit more now so I'm going to leave them there's some vine plants in the top that I was hoping would creep across the background and out across the glass but um, at the moment they haven't but they are they are actually looking like they're growing back a bit better now so fingers crossed over time they'll perk up and start doing what I wanted them to do but yeah, like I said, you know, the, these plants take a bit of time to root in. I mean, this, this setup has been going for about a year now, and some of the plants have died off and grown back. Some of them have died off and had to be replaced. The only thing that you'll find is geckos tend to climb on plants. It's what they do in the wild, and it's what they do in these setups, so you just have to keep an eye on them because they will destroy them. There's no two ways about it. They will... They will climb all over them, they will pull them out, they will tear them to shreds, but uh, as long as you're aware that's going to happen, it's not too much of a problem, to be perfectly honest. The other, the main advantage with bioactive setups that I I can see is maintenance. Now, with, um, with fake setups, if you like, if that's the right word for it, fake plants and uh, decorations that way, what you have to do every now and then is basically pull everything out, clean the enclosure down, change the substrate, clean all the plants off. You have to be really careful what chemicals you use because not so much as uh, frogs and toads, but geckos do have soft and slightly porous skin. So if you leave chemicals on the glass, you know, they, they, can, they can absorb that. And obviously, excuse me, and obviously, if they uh, drink water droplets off the side of the tank, then if there are chemicals present, there's always that risk that they will ingest something and, you know, end up really sick. And nobody wants that. Nobody wants their animals to be ill. But with a bioactive setup, it is slightly different. Uh, they are very, very low maintenance. The only thing that I have to take out and clean really on here is the food bowl, uh, the food, the bowl holder, if you like. Um, that's just held on by magnetic clips through the glass, so that's nice and easy. You literally just pull that off, wash it out, dry it off, stick it back in, job done. There are 
cleanup crews in these environments. There are isopods and uh, springtails and they deal with all the nasties, the gecko poo, any leftover food, any, uh, I feed the geckos insects every now and then and obviously if there's any bits and pieces left over, they will clean them up. Uh, the substrate, as long as you keep an eye on it, doesn't need changing. Now, I did actually have to gut these two bioactive enclosures that I've got because I'm not sure what went wrong, but I bought a pre-made substrate. I won't say where from because that's not fair. It's not their fault. Uh, but I bought a pre-made substrate for bioactive jungle environments and something went really, really wrong. It started to go mouldy. Um, I had an issue with slugs in one of them, believe it or not, but that's actually been sorted out and I've had no more problems with that. But yeah, this substrate just went really, really nasty, really mouldy. It started to smell and I had to gut these enclosures. Um, I can't, I don't understand why, I don't understand what went wrong, but it, it did. I've dealt with it and I've had no problem since. But now I actually use my own substrate, which... Uh, is equal parts there's peat moss uh, orchid bark desert sand believe it or not um, rehydrated sphagnum moss and charcoal and I use equal parts of that dump it in and uh, it seems to work wonders the plants grow really well in it which I'm happy about the plants do seem to grow well in it um, I've had no adverse effects with mold, with uh, any any smells in the environment. It just smells like smells like nothing really. It smells like earth, you know. That that's what it smells like. But uh, yeah, I've had no problem since I started using that substrate. Um, the idea for that substrate actually came from another channel, a guy called Tanner Serpa. His channel is Serpa Design. Um, he was the one that basically inspired me to build the bioactive setups because he's done a few videos on uh, different ways to build backgrounds for tanks different environments to set up different ways of making bioactive setups and uh, if you check his channel out i'm pretty sure you'll understand why i like him so much because his setups are just incredible they're beautiful they're works of art they really are so yeah go and have a look at his channel and uh, i'm sure you'll be inspired as much as i was so we'll have a bit of a closer look up at this setup. Um, you can see I'm absolutely hopeless with the names of plants. I really am. But uh, I've got kind of a, I don't know, it's, it's like a, it's a big leafy thing, basically. That's what it is. It's a big leafy thing. The leaves sort of turn, turn these dark shades of purple and red once they've grown out a little bit. You can see... There's fresh leaves growing in the centre. They're always sprouting out. Every now and then one drops off. I just leave it in there and the cleanup crews take care of everything. We have a little fern in the foreground here that seems to be doing quite well. We've got a couple of bromeliads down there. A bit further up behind this piece of java wood. I think it's java wood. I could be wrong. Who knows? It's been a while since it's been in here and I've completely forgotten. But uh, yeah, we have another couple of bromeliads in the background there we have some of the uh the vine plants that i mentioned you know they've they died off a little while ago but they're actually starting to grow back so fingers crossed they will keep on sprouting and doing them what i want them to do yeah the background itself is made up of expanding foam there's actually you can't see it too well here but there's actually a big piece of cork tube in the background to simulate like a tree trunk uh, I drilled holes in it and the gecko actually uses that as a hide which is good which is what I wanted it to do um, the background is covered with pieces of orchid bark and uh, dried cocoa fiber it seems to work really well I mean the, the environment itself I think is I think is quite nice but uh, there's plenty of places to climb for the gecko plenty of places to hide and from what I've observed that's one of the most important things in these environments. You need to give the gecko plenty of cover. Uh, it needs to feel safe and it needs to feel like if it's, if something upsets it or spooks it, it can go somewhere that it feels safe and comfortable. And that's really, really important. It's the same as us. Somebody upsets us, we want to go back home. We don't really, we don't want anything to do with them. Same thing for the geckos, you know. 
they just want to feel safe they want to feel secure and I've seen other people set up with geckos I'm not saying mine are perfect in any way but I've seen other people's where they don't they just don't give them enough climbing space climbing places places to hide I mean in here I've got a bit of rope strung between these two pieces of wood just to give the gecko something extra to climb on he's got a couple of nice you know a couple of nice tree trunks for want of a better description to climb on he's got the whole background he's got his cork tube and he's got space up the top of the tank where the background doesn't quite go all the way up where he can sit on top he can hide he can feel safe and uh, I'm not sure how well you'll see because that part of the tank is really quite well shaded but oh, the light's terrible as well there is the gecko in the background like I said you're not really going to see him too well oh there he is or was hello mate so we'll leave him in peace for a little while. The only other thing you do need for a bioactive setup is the right kind of light. Now there's a lot of controversy uh, surrounding UV lights in uh, like crested geckos, gargoyle geckos. And when you go to a shop to buy a setup, especially the less um, specialist shops, shall we say, they will always tell you that you need UV light because the gecko needs UV light, it can't live without it. And also that it will need a heat mat, a thermostat, all the uh, usual stuff you will try and, you know, they'll try and sell you with an enclosure. But they do not need UV light at all. As long as you feed them the correct diet, you feed them... I feed mine a bit of a mixture of the Rapashi and Pangea crested gecko food. And that has every single vitamin and nutrient in it that they need to live and it, it includes vitamin d so you don't actually need the uv light to simulate sunlight you don't need that light for them to be to, to be healthy as long as you're feeding the right diet you give them the right kind of environment nice clean comfortable environment they'll be fine as far as heat mats go i don't use them i keep my uh my room at 20 21 degrees and they seem more than happy with that. Uh, obviously, there are lights in these enclosures, but um, this one is actually a full spectrum daylight bulb. And the reason I've got that in there is to stimulate plant growth. Otherwise, it wouldn't actually be necessary. But you need that in there if you've got bioactive setups for the plant growth for them to remain healthy and to actually live themselves. But uh, they obviously they put out a little bit of heat, but not much. I mean, if I put my hand up there, I can comfortably keep my hand up there without the risk of getting burnt by the light because it's not putting out too much heat. But the little residual heat that it does put out does actually warm the enclosure a little bit. So it's probably 22, 23 degrees inside the enclosure itself. And my geckos all thrive like that. So the UV light is a bit of a controversial subject like i say but in my own experience they don't actually need it and i've actually had uh, a reptile specialist tell me the same thing that basically as long as you feed them the correct food give them the right environment they do not need that uv light they do not need heat mats any of that so if you're sold all of that by a pet shop you're spending money you don't need to spend. You could spend it on more important things such as decorations and anything else for the gecko. Decorations, food, all that kind of stuff. And here is the occupant of that tank, my crested gecko, Kermit. Now he's, uh, I believe, he's what they call a, he's a flame morph. I'm not 100% sure, but he's, I know he's got... Uh, quite a lot of pinstriping on him which makes him quite desirable as you can see the pattern down his dorsal area is really quite quite pretty he's got um, orange tips to some of the crests on his head I'm not sure how well you'll actually see that there you go that's not a bad shot 
but he's also got a few uh, what they call Dalmatian spots. They're the black spots you can see around uh, between his back legs area. He has a few of those all over his body. But as you can see, he's fairly chilled out. He's he's used quite used to being handled this one, so he's normally quite chilled out. But he's a lovely boy. He's actually uh, fired up at the moment. You can see the dark colouring down his sides. And you can see the fact that he's just weed on me as well. Thanks, mate. That's your contribution to the video, is it? Very helpful of you, I must say. But, uh, yeah, he's fired up at the moment. During... Uh... Do you mind? Do you mind, fella? And that's one of the risks of handling geckos when they don't want to be handled. They will actually poo on you. That's it to show their disdain for you. So uh, he's clearly not happy at the moment, so I'll put him back. As you can see, he's gone straight back up into the top corner up there. That's where he feels safe and comfortable. So for now, we'll leave him be and we'll move on to another enclosure. Okay, here's one of the two uh, fake setups that I have. Uh, this will actually be swapped out, as I said earlier, to a, a bioactive environment eventually. But I'm in no rush because even though it's not what I want at the moment, I think it's still quite a nice looking enclosure. It's nice and bright and colourful, which probably doesn't matter to the gecko but it does to to me you know I, I like a nice visually appealing setup um it actually covers the most basic needs that i've talked about before there are plenty of places to hide for the gecko which as i said i believe is most important there's there's a vine in here that it can climb on there's a couple of branches set at different angles that it can climb on it can hide underneath there's a big uh like a polystyrene I don't know simulated rock in the background down there that it can also climb on use as cover and uh yeah i mean it's not it's not what i want this setup to be but i still like it i still think it's like i say it's nice it offers the gecko everything it needs it's cover it's safety and that's all that matters to me that you know the, the uh that the gecko is happy is what's important but um, there is actually a gargoyle gecko in here and I can't for the life of me see it at the moment even though I know what I'm looking for and the gecko is about six inches long at the moment I still can't see it and that's the key to this environment if the gecko wants to come out and be seen it will if it doesn't it won't believe me it's that simple but um, yeah there's not really much to say about this environment uh, the light you can see, again, is just a different different spectrum uh, daylight bulb because obviously, as I said, as I've covered before, you don't need the UV light, you don't need any of that. But uh, when this is bioactive, it will have the daylight bulb for plant growth, etc. So yeah, there's there's not a lot else to say about this environment, uh, even though it's not perfect, or for me, even though it's not bioactive, I still like it. Now this is actually, I probably should have started with this one because this is actually my favourite bioactive setup. As you can see there's a lot more plant cover in this one. This is what I was hoping the other one will turn out like eventually once everything starts to grow back in as it should. This has got the same substrate mix in at the bottom that I use for the Crested Gecko setup. You can see it's got a nice deep drainage layer nice deep layer of substrate that slopes back up towards the back of the enclosure just adds a little bit more depth to the uh, sort of visual aspect of it it's got a nice big uh, bromeliad in the top of it it's got a few of these air plants that actually don't need substrate to grow in they just grow on whatever you attach them to they're really quite quite fascinating it's a similar thing to the uh, crested gecko setup there's a uh, expanding foam background covered in cocoa fiber there's a coconut hide up the top which the gecko occasionally uses but most of the time it's actually hiding 
underneath one of these branches now I can actually see this gecko but you're probably not going to so I'm going to try and get this one out in a moment and uh, let you see it but uh, yeah again it's a really simple setup the cleanup crew are present as before so it's very very low maintenance there's the food bowl this is the only bit I ever have to take off and clean so you know that the main advantage with bioactive setups is maintenance is ease of maintenance once it's set up it pretty much looks after itself you only have to do uh, spot cleaning if the gecko makes a mess or you know if something goes wrong with any of the plants you just have to trim them take them out replace them whatever but it is so much easier to look after than any other kind of environment which is why i personally like bioactive setups it's just the fact that they are such low maintenance you don't disturb the animal unnecessarily by pulling everything out every time you have to clean it and i like that the more natural environment the better it is for the animal that's that's my opinion on i know i keep repeating myself but you know that, that's what i say to a lot of other people that ask me about bioactive setups and why i do them it's to try and provide as natural an environment as i can for the animal and uh in all honesty they seem they seem quite happy with it one other thing you need to do with these environments is mist them the gecko needs water now i provide a water bowl but the geckos don't really tend to drink out of it i always offer it anyway just uh just so it's there for them they will mainly drink water off of the plants off of, they'll drink droplets off the side of the glass every single day i will give it a good misting at least once a day now i've actually done this one but uh this is the sort of thing i use just a normal garden sprayer and i will literally just the good thing about this is you can get in behind the plants into the plant pots in the background and you can just give everything a nice soak in so that uh, it keeps the humidity up the plants get watered and the gecko has the opportunity to drink so this is the gecko in question this is my gargoyle gecko uh, this one is called streak say hello streak hello uh, this one is nowhere near fully grown yet. Where are you going? <laughs> you soppy. Come here, look, look. Come here, there you go. So this one is nowhere near fully grown, even though you can see well, the size of my hand is a decent size. He's still got a lot of growing to do. He's about 18 months old now. I think they reach sort of full size in about two or three years. But uh, he's actually three times the size he was when i bought him so he's put on quite a lot of size now these get a lot chunkier than the crested geckos sorry just showing off his markings there i think he's absolutely beautiful he's what they call a striped morph and you can you can clearly see why and he is an active little thing aren't you you won't stay still for very long He's a little bit more jumpy than the crested gecko, but he does calm down after a few minutes. But if you do handle these geckos, do not ever, ever squeeze them and try and keep them in one place because you can do a lot of damage to these. All you've got to do is offer them like I'm doing, just hand to hand, and they will walk from one hand to the other, and eventually they calm down. They're, they're a little skittish for a few minutes. Excuse my dodgy camera work here but you can see just how beautiful these little things are now when he's sticking his tongue out it's kind of like a snake he's tasting the air he's tasting his environment and those hello what are you gonna do oh okay you're gonna sit on top of the camera <laughs> oh i wish i could get a picture of this i really do come here come here mate there you go but I absolutely love this little gecko. He's the first first gecko I owned. And the, the other two gargoyles I got shortly after this. But this is actually the first, the first kind of exotic pet, I suppose, that I ever owned. And I absolutely adore him. 
Oh, I really do. He, he's so beautiful. He's slightly different to the Crested Gecko as well. In uh, Their feet are different. The Crested Gecko has bigger pads on its feet. And uh, it will stick to things a lot easier than this one will. But this one does have little claws on its feet that it uses to climb as well. And one thing they do like to do, if I can get him to do it, is jump. Especially this one. And you're not going to do it. Are you? Oh, there you go. Uh, you didn't actually see it, but you did jump from one hand onto my arm. But yeah, they uh, they also use their tail to grip. As you can see, he's curling his tail around the inside of my fingers there. And they do have a, a little, uh, almost like a sticky pad on the end of their tail, which they use. It helps them climb. It helps them when they jump. It helps them to stop and break and actually land on things. And they do use it to their advantage. Uh, they can drop their tail. But uh, unlike the Crested Gecko, when these guys drop their tail, it grows back. It will never actually be 100% like their original tail, but they can grow it back and it will look very similar. But this one's actually been, he's calming down quite a lot now. So as you can see, this guy is quite chilled out now. He's quite relaxed on my hand. He's not trying to run away too much. He's not trying to to jump about. So, I mean, after a few minutes, they do calm down. If you handle them regularly, they get used to it, as you can see from this one. But, uh, yeah, as you can see by the uh, different lumps on his head, that's where they got the name Gargoyle Gecko from, because that, that shape of their head resembles horns, and it looks like a, a, a gargoyle on a church, really. But uh, the other name... Their Latin name is Rachidactylus auriculatus, and the auriculatus bit stands for eared gecko. And, uh, you know, the, the other thing these lumps look like is ears on the side of their head. So that's, that's where that name came from. But these guys make ideal pets. They are very low maintenance. You feed them, like I said earlier, the Rapashi or Pangea crested gecko diet and you just feed them that every other day the food's easy to make it comes in a powder and you just uh, mix the powder up with water and put it into their their dish and uh, they will find it and they will eat out of it now like I said I actually feed these guys insects every little while just uh, a couple of red runners a week or a couple of crickets depending on what I've got to hand and the they will take it down quite happily now one other thing i wanted to show you are those eyes they are what most people will actually uh be fascinated by on a gecko those eyes are just stunning now they don't have eyelids they actually have like a covering on the eye which uh protects it it stops it from uh getting any debris or anything in there but um they don't have eyelids, so they can't close their eyes. But what they do instead is they regulate the light coming into the eyes by closing that iris up, as you can see it demonstrating there. And when they close that iris, you can see that amazing pattern behind the eye. And the other thing I like, you can see around the outside of his eyes, that little yellow ring. Now they... I wish I could keep my hand still so you could see it properly. But uh, that, that colour differs from gecko to gecko. But yeah, that's, there's so many different things that are fascinating and beautiful about these. And I think they are wonderful, underrated pets. I think we've had him out for long enough now. So we'll put him back and we'll let him settle again. And this is the, the last setup. Again, this one is uh, fake plants uh, a couple of branches in there a couple of vines in there wrapped around at different points there's another coconut hide in the back which this gecko does tend to use um, again it's a nice simple setup there's plenty of cover it's a nice safe comfortable environment and that's all it will need again this one i don't think you're gonna see because i can't either <laughs> 
they normally come out at night when it's dark so maybe i should try to get some footage of that once they're out you might actually see them a bit better but uh yeah it's just a nice a nice simple setup and again i like the way it looks even though it isn't bioactive it will be but these things take time to create and unfortunately they take quite a bit of money to create as well so you can't rush them so uh i hope you enjoyed that video uh while i'm here i'll give you a quick update on the uh the tadpole situation now this morning i've I've cleaned this tank out, I've removed all of the tadpoles that I can find. Unfortunately, I don't have as many as I thought I did because basically I, mu I must have left them in there for a little bit too long and the fish have gone to town on them. Basically, they've, they've eaten a lot. Now, I've ended up with uh, 19 tadpoles that I've managed to rescue that are alive, that are safe. And I've got those now in a separate environment, so hopefully I'm going to be able to raise them to the, you know, to become full-size uh, fire-belly toads. So I'll keep you updated on that. But unfortunately, I don't have as many as I hoped for. I will learn that lesson in the future if my toads breed again. I will obviously remove any eggs and that I can find as soon as I find them. Uh, but like I say, I've got, I've got a few that I can work with, a few that I can hopefully raise, and we'll see what happens with those. So uh, I'll keep you updated, like I say. But for now, that's it for this video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and I'll see you in the next video.